Good evening. We're going to call the special city council or regular city council meeting to order and uh, determine if a quorum is present. It's 630. Uh, we have a quorum. We are ready to proceed. Uh, we will start with the invocation. Do we have uh, Pastor Mills? Pastor Milford, I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Joyce, you see Pastor Milford around here? I do not, Mayor. Okay, well, we will uh, forego the invocation for right now and proceed on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, can we have uh, Chief Kobe lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you so much, Chief. Okay, we have uh, acknowledgements and presentations. Uh, promotional announcement of new captain and lieutenant for the Castle Hills Police Department. Chief Zudiga. Mayor, Council, citizens, oh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to start out first. Uh, uh, Talking about this uh, officer, uh, Tony Crawford started his law enforcement career with the uh, Castle Hills Police Department in June uh, 2015. Prior to Castle Hills, Tony was working for the Bear County's Detention Center as a detention officer. Tony has been promoted up uh, or has promoted up the ranks as a corporal and then a sergeant in uh, 2019. Tony has been instrumental in getting the department updated by uh, leading the revamp of the patrol and the sergeant's office uh, a year or so ago. Tony is very well uh, detail oriented, which has served him and will serve him well in his new position. Please welcome uh, Lieutenant Tony Crawford. Secondly, uh, Wayne Wagner has been serving the law enforcement, uh, has been serving law enforcement for over 25 years, 25, or I'm sorry, 21 of which was, has been with Castle Hills Police Department. Wayne has graduated from the Leadership Command College as well as the FBI Leadership Trilogy. He also has attended the command level uh, leadership series and other various leadership and management courses. Most importantly, his lengthy tenure with uh, service with the Castle Hills community has afforded him the ability to build many relationships with the citizenry and city employees, as well as business owners within the community. He has a clear understanding of the expecta expectations of the citizens of Castle Hills, of the, the citizens of Castle Hills have of, of their police department, and will, in, and will ensure that they are satisfied. Please welcome Captain Wayne Wagner. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next up, we will recognize uh, an acknowledgement of completion of one year probationary term with the Castle Hills Fire Department as firefighter, Chief. Mayor, council, city staff, residents. Um, Kevin Curlin joined our department on March 28th of 2020. 
In the past year, he's excelled at achieving his requirements as a probationary firefighter and has become a valued member of BSHIP in the department. I would like at this time to present Firefighter Curlin with his firefighter shield and his badge. Kevin. Okay, next up we have the introduction of our new code compliance officer, or code and compliance inspector, Mr. Rapley. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to introduce uh, Priscilla Vasquez. She's our new code compliance officer. Um, recently, she spent the last 15 years uh, with the SAPD as a senior crime scene investigator. Uh, she has spent time working at Bear County Adult Probation and um, working for the appraisal district. Uh, she has a uh, undergraduate from um, Our Lady of the Lake and a master's degree from University of Central Oklahoma. Uh, she has been on the job for the last 30 days, has done a great job, already hit the ground running and getting acclimated to the position and community. Uh, Ms. Vasquez reports to Mr. Zamarone, who will provide support on enforcement matters. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Vasquez. Mayor, real quick, it's not, it's not on the agenda, but uh, the chief would like to acknowledge a new dispatcher recently hired as well. Go ahead, chief. Thank you. Uh, lastly, uh, Brittany Strom started her law enforcement career working in the uh, Cherokee County Jail for approximately one year. She then moved uh, into dispatch for the next four years, earning her telecommunicator license and her advanced certificate. She served as a trainer, a CTO, and as a assistant terminal agency coordinator. She loves working in law enforcement and has been for the last four years. Please welcome Brittany Strom as our newest dispatcher of PD. Thank you. Okay, next we'll proceed to uh, citizen comments. I understand we have quite a, people, quite a few people signed up for individual items. Is there anybody here to speak on non-agenda items? Okay, we will proceed on to the consent agenda. Mr. May? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt the consent agenda. Thank you so much. A second. A second by Mr. Joyce. All in favor? Mr. Mayor, discussion. On 5.4, there's nothing I want to change, just an observation that it is incomplete when you do not provide in there what a citizen input on an item said. There's absolutely void of what the citizen input said in this very important meeting. And it's a suggestion that in the future, we add what the citizens said when they had a chance to talk on something. That's all, our, that's a suggestion. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, all in favor? 
Unanimous. Thank you, Council. We will proceed on to item 6.1, discussion of possible action on the appointment of Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Paul. Excuse me. I'd like to nominate Joe Isbrand. He's been Mayor Pro Tem for the past year, and I think he's done a good job of helping out where needed. And he showed that especially as well as some others during the uh, recent freeze in uh, during February. Second. Uh, we have a motion for Mr. Isbrand by Mr. Paul and a second by Mr. May. All in favor? Unanimous. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next we have an update from the Castle Hills Community Organization regarding the Castle Hills Fiesta 2021. Uh, Mayor, City Councilman, it's good to, to see everyone here. Uh, my name is Norma McClelland, and I'm the director of Fiesta Castle Hills. I guess you could say uh, 2020 and 2021. Uh, <laughs> so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a rundown on um, how things are proceeding there, going very well. Um, to give everyone an idea of what happens at Fiesta Castle Hills, we do have our 5K fun run at 8 o'clock. And we're already uh, registering individuals for the fun run. And we do have a professional timing company that does that. So we do get quite a few runners. Uh, next at 10 o'clock, we have our parade. And in case you were wondering, we are the only street parade in the city of San Antonio for Fiesta. <laughs> and so it will be led by Chief Zuniga. And um, we have uh, a number of dignitaries. We have are very, we've been very lucky to have Miss Fiesta. She's going to participate in the parade as well as El Rey Feo and his group, pardon me, his group. And then our grand marshals are gonna be Corporal Romeo Munoz and Patrolman Garrett Earlywine. Uh, if y'all remember they were hurt recently and been off the job. And so they are gonna be our grand marshals for the parade this year. Um, following that, we, I guess y'all might know, but we do have the fair that starts at 10 o'clock and, uh, we have live music. We have a fantastic children's area this year and booths, uh, are amazing. We're already full. We, we have a waiting list right now for people that are asking for booths. So we have artists and vendors and we have food booths and thank you very much for approving it. We now have a margarita and beer booth. <laughs> So, and that does end at five o'clock. And uh, again, it's going really well. And I thank you for your time. Uh, we do have some flyers if anybody is interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Clem. <laughs> thank you all for, thank you all for everything that you do to make it possible. Okay, item next is uh, 6.3 public hearing on application from Ryan Ramey for a special use permit for the property located at the southeast corner of West Avenue at Loop 410, CB 5006, PTPF, P-2, ABS 706, for the property construction of the new commercial business structure, less than 1,500 square feet total floor area, contrary to section 50-348 building area. Mr. Rapley. Uh, Mayor, this is, oh. I'm sorry, yes, ma'am, it's uh, 644. We'll open the public hearing. Mayor, we have the applicant, Ryan Ramey, uh, who is representing Dutch Brothers on the line to speak to the request for the SUP. Um, the size of the building um, has triggered an SUP uh, for uh, their project for Dutch Brothers Coffee due to the uh, square footage. Um, this went to zoning on May 4th uh, and was unanimously approved by the Zoning Commission. Um, and we have Chairman Solis here to speak to that as well. Okay, we'll do the public hearing right now. Um, we don't have anybody signed up. Does anybody like to speak? Okay, we will close the public hearing at 645 and move on to item 6.4, discussion and possible action on ordinance number 2021-05-18-A regarding a special use permit being granted to Ryan Ramey for Dutch Bros Coffee for construction of a building with less than 1,500 square feet of floor area on the property at the southeast corner of Loop 410 and West Building Area. Chairman Solis. 
Good afternoon. Why is that a good evening already? Um, this is um, for us before zoning commission it passed unanimously. We, we realized that this was the normal size actually for the Dutch brothers throughout their footprint. So it was an adjustment that needed to be placed uh, and the SUP was recommended by our legal department to be able to address uh, the need for them to have uh, to move forward. And so the zoning commission moved it unanimously, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Mayor, just another point where you're in the process of reviewing their construction plans. Um, I would ask Mr. Ramey to elaborate on, on a timeline, uh, but we um, are involved in um, reviewing that and should be done here uh, in the next uh, week or so. And this was part of the administrative process to completing the permit. Uh, Mr. Ramey, would you like to provide some uh, background on the timeline? I know that y'all are pretty good at doing what y'all do. Well, oh, thank you, sir. Um, appreciate you guys allowing me to speak today. Um, like, like Mr. Rapley said, we are we're in for building permit right now. We've received uh, one round of comments on the civil and architectural set. Um, our team of Luna Middleman architects, Pape Dawson engineers, and Horizon uh, landscape architects are all uh, working on updates to the plans right now. Um, all of them are local local uh, engineers and architects. So they know the code very well and um, should have these updated in the next week or so. We will then resubmit everything uh, to the plan reviewers for another round of review and comments. Uh, if everything looks good and we are awarded a building permit, we will start construction within about a week or two of obtaining the permit. Um, Right now, we kind of have June 7th to 14th circled um, for a construction start. We, from there, uh, we build these buildings in 75 to 90 days. And then Dutch Bros will open about two weeks after that. So I think given that construction start um, early June, early to mid June, we'll deliver the building sometime in August or September, and then Dutch Rose will open a couple weeks after that in late September, early October. Perfect, thank you, Mr. Ramey. Council, Mr. Joyce. I move that we approve the special use permit for Ryan Ramey of Dutch Brothers Coffee by ordinance number 2021-05-18-A. Thank you, Mr. Joyce. Second. Second by Mr. May, do we have any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much, Council and Mr. Ramey. Thank you so much. We look forward to having Dutch Bros here soon. Next. Thanks up, for having me. We'll uh, we'll get to work here. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, we have a public hearing on the geographical boundaries for the RR residential zoning district. It is 6:48, and we will open the public hearing. Uh, first up, we have uh, Mr. Quentin Baker. Hi, Quentin Baker, 213 Hibiscus. Um, I was actually expecting we'd have the boundary diagram up before I got up to speak. Um, Zoning Commission recommended a boundary for the rural residential district. Do we have that available? It'll make this discussion go a whole lot easier. Well, Mr. Rapley is bringing it up. I'm here to speak in favor of the boundary as recommended by the Zoning Commission. If you'll recall from prior discussions, the rural residential uh, zoning overlay was created for this area for four primary reasons. Uh, one of them being the narrow streets, another being the lack of stormwater infrastructure, another lack of sanitary sewer, and of course the aesthetics of the area. I think the boundary as uh, drawn and adopted by the Zoning Commission accomplishes all four of those items. Um, as you see the boundary that's on the plat now, um, all of the current uh, residential A properties are within that boundary. All of the commercially zoned properties are outside of the boundary. So we don't have to worry about any commercial entities 
The um, Christian school proper is outside the boundary, as is the church property, the, Cas the, the uh, Castle Hills First Baptist Church area. And then the one other area that's outside of that boundary is the housing PUD. That's along West Avenue. That's that little almost triangular shape cutout that you see along that that's already um, smaller lots, very about a higher density area. Everything else is in. I do want to make specific mention of McGimsey Park, which is inside of that boundary. Um, I strongly recommend the inclusion of McGimsey Park uh, because it plays a vital role for our city for stormwater runoff. That 100 acres catches a lot of water. Um, there are two major inflows from the city of San Antonio that go right into McGimsey Park. It's basically being used as a floodplain. There's one inflow that comes off of Northwest Military Highway right by the old Jack in the Box up there. And a second that comes across Wedgwood right into the middle of the west or northwest side of McGimsey Park. San Antonio actually has a drainage improvement project going on the San Antonio side coming into McGimsey Park that's just going to accelerate the flow into the park. So we badly need McGimsey Park to stay open land and to allow it to contain and slow the water flow off. That all drains down to the Almas Creek, which runs behind um, Box Hall, Box Hall Cove, and dumps into Antonian, Mary Magdalene ball fields, to Church and Aggie Park, all of which are already prone to flooding. So I would implore you to keep McGimsey Park in the Rural Residential District so we have some control over the use of that land and protect us from any added runoff of water that might come off that land. That's all I had tonight, Council. I strongly encourage you to adopt uh, this route boundary for the Rural Residential District. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Jane Garcia. Um, my name is Jane Garcia. I live at 111 Hibiscus Lane. Um, I may have signed up for the wrong item. This is just a comment on the rural residential district, not so much the boundaries. But um, anyhow, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager, who's departed. Um, I think you can tell we have many, many neighbors and residents here in Castle Hills who are committed to and passionate about their city and preservation of their property. So thank you for working with us to protect our rural residential properties, our land, and really our daily lives, how we all live day in and day out. This rural residential zoning district will help ensure that Castle Hills will continue to be a special gem here in the middle of a large, rapidly growing city by limiting encroachment and potential overdevelopment by people who may not care about our special city and way of life as much as we do. Again, thank you in advance for approving, we hope, this important and protective rural residential designation for your fellow neighbors and for our city. Thank you. Uh, next up, Mr. Bruce Miley Caleb. Okay, uh, Mr. Steve, or Dr. Stephen Ackley. Thank you, uh, Stephen Ackley, uh, 118 West Castle Lane, uh, Mayor, uh, City Council. Uh, I'd like to stand here in, in uh, support of the rural residential district boundaries as shown, specifically the areas uh, uh, north of uh, West Castle Lane, which uh, the properties on the north side of West Castle Lane are now within the uh, rural residential district as the boundary is on the Christian church and uh, school side. And we think this is very important for the protection and, and preservation of that uh, of that area. Um, it's been a while since we've been here, but I'd like to mention that the, uh, the impetus for this was actually citizen oriented. We uh, had mounted a petition asking that the areas of those streets within that area um, are part of a rural residential district, and that was uh, signed by over 50% of the the homeowners in that particular area. So it has strong support within that area. And uh, just like to second the comments of, of uh, uh, Quentin Baker about the importance of including McGinsey Park. Uh, the Almost Creek actually extends, if, if you think about it, it extends all the way up past, uh, almost up to Dezabella Street. So it's a, a tremendous watershed that's coming down through there. 
And of course, we have no control at all over what might be happening up there. Uh, and uh, it's a, a drainage basin, as, as Mr. Baker pointed out, that funnels down right into the West Avenue uh, area. So it's very important that we at least keep our section of uh, Castle Hills intact for those drainage por uh, portions, including here. Again, thank you very much for your support of this, and uh, we're happy to continue in uh, discussions on this, and, uh, and uh, we think it's going to be a real gem for Castle Hills. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We also have Mr. Uh, Skip McCormick signed up. Are you with us, sir? Yes, I'm here, and uh, I can ha have a, a couple of very short comments. One is uh, the it's the importance of acting to include McGimsey Park within the uh, rural residential district now, rather than postponing this to some later date. The problem with McGimsey Park, is, as most of you may, may already know, is that it is uh, on a deed to the scouts for use as a scout camp with the possibility of reverter to the original donors in the event that the scouts at some point decide not to use it as a scout camp. <clears throat> what that means is that there is a possibility that, that the ownership could change almost instantly without us being aware of it or knowing anything about it. And a plan to uh, to develop that 100 acres or so could be filed. And once it's filed, then there is a presumption of, of grandfather status with regard to the existing uh, zoning at that time. So if we delay till sometime later on, it's almost guaranteed that any effort later to try to rezone this to provide some restrictions on, on lot size uh, and impermeability or of cover uh, to help with drainage would, would be impossible to do. So it's important that we go ahead and do this now rather than to postpone it and hope to be able to do it timely sometime later on when that timely is not going to be a possibility. Um, I think that there has been a good deal of, of conversation with the owners of the individual lots uh, that are concerned uh, in this area. And a, a large number of them have appeared to support the rural residential district. It's been notable that we've had very few people. I think we had one person who opposed this, uh, this uh, idea of the rural residential district. The rest of the 126 or so residents seem to be strongly in support of it. And I strongly recommend the council act to approve the, uh, the boundaries as uh, recommended by the zoning commission. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Do we have anybody else that would like to speak? Mr. Bella. City Council, good, uh, good evening to you. I'm Peter Bella from 110 Hibiscus, and I simply do also very much support this boundary as shown. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bella. Uh, do we have anybody else? Yes, Ms. Ackley. Good evening, council people, mayor, Mr. Appley. I'm Jacqueline Ackley at 118 West Castle Lane. Um, it's been a while since we've addressed this body about the rural residential area. I'm sure you've got great memories and remember the gem-like qualities that are bringing the citizens to ask for this rural residential designation and the boundaries described, which of course I do support. The drainage issue has been discussed this evening. And so, and that, uh, if it's kept very residential, rural, uh, we're grass can absorb the runoff and trees can drink it as opposed to it accumulating and flooding homes. <clears throat> if we can keep the resident, the rural nature of this residential area, it would be a win for both the citizens who live in those homes and drive in those streets, but also for the city because if dense development is allowed to progress in this area, um, eventually there come a point when expensive storm sewers will have to be installed, uh, streets will have to be widened. That would be a large expense to the city, as I know you know. Um, and that would also 
change the nature of the area, which right now is very r rural. And that was the other point I wanted to just mention that it's an accident of history that we've ended up with this little area here where the lots are large and and the houses are less dense and therefore with fewer residents and less stormwater runoff, there's a copacetic situation with narrow streets and no drainage infrastructure and that's just fine. And um, we have perhaps because of the McGimsey Boy Scout Ranch, a reservoir of wild animals over here. We frequently see foxes, the occasional coyote, many deer run through here. Foxes, some of whom live on top of our roofs or in the second story of homes before they're renovated. Uh, and recently a neighbor has seen a ringtail cat, which is very unusual. And I myself have not seen that, but look forward to it. People from all other areas of Castle Hills come here to do their walks, to ride their bikes, to push the strollers because of this miraculous environment that exists there. And I'm sure if, if you've walked or driven through there, you're familiar with that. And that is the essence we're trying to preserve. So yes, the drainage is a hugely important thing which could be costly to the city if not kept absorbed by grassy areas and trees. But the essence of this area is so special that that is one of the primary motivators for us to keep it the way it is as a, as a rural residential area. Thank you for letting me just speak to that and remind us all of that special quality. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ackley. If there's nobody else assigned to speak, we will close the public hearing at 7.02 and proceed on item 6.6, .6, discussion and possible action on resolution 2021-05-18 regarding the geographical boundaries of the land in the city of Castle Hills eligible to be in the RR Rural Residential Zoning District and directing city staff to initiate a rezoning process. Chairman Solis. Mayor, I was remiss to introduce myself as a proud graduate of San Houston State University, the FCS football champion just <laughs> crowned this Saturday. <clears throat> Bearcats. Um, <laughs> I will also say that this was an interesting endeavor. You had asked us and given us the charge of creating the rural residential district, and we did. And now we're the, the harder part is the boundaries. Quite honestly, if you look at the boundaries, we looked upon it not only in words as my fellow commissioners, Mr. McCormick talked about, but also in the fact that when you look at what we outlined, it's an opportunity, it's a starting point. It's not the end all. That's what we have public hearings still scheduled. We have more opportunities to review this. And so from that perspective, when you look at us, including Gimsky Park, what was important for me was notification to them. If they were not part of it, then they would have not been notified of what was going on with everything else. So from my perspective as chair, I thought that was important that we were more inclusive uh, so people understood what was gonna take place in the immediate area. So it is a starting point. It is recommended that we move on. Uh, but we will conduct public hearings. We will do more uh, to ensure that we do this properly. Thank Are you, Chairman. Any questions for me? No. Council, do we have any uh, questions for Chairman Solis? No. Thank yeah. you, sir. Mr. Gregory? Yes, sir. Was the committee or was there a third party that came before the Zoning Commission with this map? Yes, sir. It was presented by the neighborhood. If that, you consider that a third committee, yes, sir. Then I have a question of the city attorney, Mr. Snow. Does this third party have standing to do this? Uh, Mr. Gregory, um, the recommendations and comments from the neighborhood came from gentlemen like Mr. Bella, uh, Mr. Baker, uh, Dr. And, and Ms. Ackley, uh, among others, um, and the discussions and the proposals they made or the suggestions they made uh, resonated with your zoning commission and resulted in the zoning commission's recommendation of the boundaries you see on the screen being the areas that are recommended to be eligible to be in the rural residential district. You are not this evening 
move it, changing the zoning on one square inch of dirt. You're simply, if the resolution that was presented to the governing body is adopted, you're basically agreeing that these boundaries make sense to be for the property eligible, to be in the RR Rural Residential District. And then as Chairman Solis said, the Zoning Commission will then more, take more formal action and make a formal recommendation after holding public hearings and after every single property owner whose um, uh, home or land is affected plus additional people within 500 feet of any of those properties are given written notice and an opportunity to be speak. And whatever they say will be, I'm sure, considered um, carefully by your zoning commission. If I could, I, I do wanna emphasize that the map properly reflects the zoning commissioner's uh, thoughts and process also. It was not given to us as a rubber stamp for us just to look at, our, it was a good starting point. Uh, but it truly reflects when you see the exclusion of churches and businesses and commercial areas. Uh, that was something that the zoning commissioners also felt from the very start. This map we finally agreed upon when you saw some of the stuff that we've had to deal with. There were several versions that we dealt with uh, that came forth before us. This is the one that kind of fit what was our sentiments. Uh, and, and we want to begin as a starting point, as I, I pointed out. I have another question, Mr. Snow. When you want to close a street in the city, this, the code requires that everybody on the block agree to the closure of the street. If you want to change direction of the street, it requires almost unanimous approval of the change of the street. Is there any number required of the people within this zone who have to approve this or not? Uh, the, the residents do not get to vote on this, Mr. Gregory. The Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing, probably more than one, and they will hear from residents and any resident who uh, does not want their property included in the rural residential district, uh, the change from probably the A single family district to the RR rural residential district can make their request to the zoning commission during public hearings. And ultimately, again, in front of this governing body, uh, when it comes to the governing body to make the uh, decision on the recommendation of the zoning commission about zoning changes. Um, uh, that's no different from any other zoning case. So McGimsey Park or anybody else within these boundaries can at some time in the future request to be opted out of this new residential district? They can ask, that doesn't mean they get. And for purposes of clarification, um, with respect to Mr. McCormick, I do not believe that there is a reverter of all of the McGimsky land back to the original donors. Um, there is a material portion on my reading of the deeds, a material portion that does not revert back to the donors, but instead would revert to the city of Castle Hills and remain restricted for park use. Um, I, I don't have that document in front of me right now, um, but um, Mr. Mr. Gregory, I believe you may have also seen those documents historically. That is, that is correct. Uh, Mr. Mayor, City Attorney states it exactly correct. Any further questions, Mr. Gregory? Council? No, thank you. I believe we had uh, Mr. McCormick sign up to speak on this one. Mr. McCormick? Don't believe I have anything to add. Um, Okay. Uh, any further discussion, Council? Mayor, um, can I ask Mr. Schnall uh, real quick to sort of give the next steps and um, potential timeline real yes, quick sir. on the rezoning process? Um, certainly, Mr. Rapley. And, and um, I, I, I do think Chairman Solis um, is, is going to be an integral um, leader in this process as the chair of the Zoning Commission as will Mr. McCormick and all the other members of the Zoning Commission. But under state law, to change zoning requires written notice to the owners of property affected by the zoning change and the owners of other property within 200 feet 
of the subject property for rezoning. Our local ordinance expands that 200 feet distance to 500 feet. So the first step is going to be a staff or administrative step of the, uh, the city administration identifying not only the, the 100 plus lots in the area that is under consideration now to be eligible for the RR zoning, but also all the owners of property within 500 feet of each of those properties um, and to uh, create a notice um, to all of those property owners, which would be mailed at least 10 days before the date of a public hearing before the zoning commission on the question of possible rezoning. Um, therefore, it may not be at the June 1st zoning commission meeting. The first public hearing may likely, in fact, likely will be at the zoning commission meeting in July. Um, and depending on the comments that the Zoning Commission hears um, at that July meeting during the public hearing and its own um, deliberations, the Zoning Commission may elect to make a recommendation to the governing body um, at its July meeting. It may elect to have a second public hearing in August and then make its recommendation in August. Um, ultimately, um, notice of the public hearing before the city council must be published in a local newspaper at least 16 days prior to the date of the public hearing by the city council. And, and then after that public hearing, the city council will be asked to vote on what properties would be rezoned from whatever their current designation is, presumably all or almost all are currently zoned um, a single family residence and, and those that would be then uh, rezoned to um, the RR Rural Residential District. Um, we, we wanted to bring this item to the governing body in order to try and streamline that process of giving notice. Just if I could follow up what the, the Zoning Commission now will be recommending is that we do at minimum two public hearings. And if the third one will actually look on a Saturday, I think it's important that we have all opportunities for people to participate and understand the seriousness of what's taking place. It's a major parcels, major part of the city of Castle Hills. And it's important that we have inclusive opportunities for people to participate and give their opinion about something that's gonna be overall reaching to them. So it's important that we will have a minimum, I'm saying today two, uh, I'm looking also looking for a Saturday, which may be our third one, that we can be able to squeeze between July and August, uh, so we have it ready by the end of September, I mean, by the September meeting to make a full recommendation to you all. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? Mr. Isbrand. Um, Chairman Sully, before you sit down, may I ask you a question, please? Let you get your steps in. Yeah, steps in. <laughs> Me and Peter get our steps in over there at Harburger Park. Um, thank you all, first of all, for the, the excellent work that you do. I appreciate uh, watching the Zoning Commission from afar and seeing the seriousness by which you all deliberate the matters that come before you. Um, I did have one question regarding McGimsey. Had, has the commission had any communication with anyone at McGimsey? And if so, has there been any acknowledgement, any comment, any any input whatsoever from them? It's my understanding that I don't think anyone member has been able to reach out to them because it hasn't been included officially. Uh, this is the designation that provides it, that it's an official component of it. So after our zoning meeting, which made the recommendation to y'all, uh, we understand completely that you all have the final approval. So therefore I would think somebody may reach out to them, but it's gonna be my expectation, the city manager uh, and the normal process as it would for any citizen within that area. Okay, so at so this- So we have not. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, uh, Mr. Joyce. I'd just like to commend Mr. Felice and his commission and the neighbors as well. Man, you guys have worked really hard on this. Thank you for this tremendous job. I know you had, a, I saw three meetings at y'all and there was probably more than that, but thank you for that great work, you guys. And I'm just gonna throw out a couple of things. I appreciate the fact that you still plan to talk to folks because I think one of the most important things of folks you need to talk to is distinguishing between 
developed land and undeveloped land. Uh, for example, those five or six lots there across from the church that once belonged to the church on South Winston. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the impact of that, if this becomes an RR district, would take a piece of property, each of those lots that can now support theoretically two houses. And if it goes to RR, it can support just one. So I would, I would expect some pushback from that group. And um, anyway, I'm glad you're gonna to talk to them because I think they need to, to be involved. In yes, sir. In fact, that's what the public hearing process yeah. is all about, right? It, it, it was important for me was when you look at the map was again, <clears throat> was the inclusive part of it forces the city, forces us to basically reach out to every single home, I mean, property owner. So understanding what's coming and, and for, for them to give us the opportunity uh, to provide input. I think it's important that we, we continue to reach out to people, our neighbors, they're not anybody else, but they're our neighbors uh, to give them the opportunity to understand what is being proposed. Thank you. And the significance of it. Mr. Gregory. But Mr. Solis, what you're saying is the process is yet to be concluded, but we're about two thirds of the way through. Say it again, I apologize. The process is about two thirds of the way concluded, but there's more to go before we should have a final vote. Yes, sir. Are we, you're going to have, um, today you give us the permission to be able to notify the city, uh, everybody that's within the boundary that's, that we're looking at as a starting point. Again, I use it as a starting point because I think it properly outlines what we're looking forward to. Uh, and yes, we, this is the second step. The first was the designation. This is the second step. And the third will be the adoption, which would be the third component. So to your step, yes, sir, we're two thirds way. Um, but nothing is predetermined and nothing is ordained. It is all a work in progress, which is what we want to be able to do to make sure that it is a fair, and opportunity, uh, fair opportunity for every resident, every property owner. That's what their property is all about. Uh, to have that opportunity to express their concerns or their support. And we've seen it through petition, the support that is there already. And again, I, Jack, excuse me, Councilman, you are exactly right. Working with the neighborhood has been, uh, it's been fun. It's been long. It's been pleasure, you know, pleasurable at times, but uh, it, it is, it is uh, to us a work in progress. And that's what policy making is all about. Inclusion. Thank you guys. Hey, for the, Mr. Paul. I had something, uh, Mr. Snow, if I may. So what I'm hearing is that once, if the council approves the recommendation by zoning, we're doing, we're approving the lines in the sand, if you will, and then the people within the lines of that sand will in fact be notified, what do you think of this, that in fact the lines in the sand can change if that be necessary to solve a lot of issues that may be developed. Am I off base here? Uh, no, sir. I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with lines in the sand. Okay. But, uh, but generally speaking, Andres, if you will. <laughs> generally speaking, that, that's correct. I mean, the, the idea of the resolution before the city council tonight is to give guidance to the city administration and the zoning commission that the council agrees that the boundaries shown on the drawing um, are, are, is the area the council agrees should be eligible to be rezoned to the rural residential district. As Mr. Joyce pointed out a few moments ago, there may be property owners who, when they get a letter saying, hey, we're thinking about or planning to rezone your property from a single family to RR rural residential, will come and, and be heard at the Zoning Commission, and that may ultimately change what recommendation will come from the Zoning Commission. As Mr. Solis said, he used the word, it's not preordained, and, and it certainly isn't. But, but if we don't start with some parameters, then the administration doesn't know who to give notice to. I understand. My, my question, I watched uh, the zoning meetings also, and I believe the way this all got started was last year when somebody decided they wanted to uh, replant some lots in the area over there. Uh, I wasn't on council. I was definitely against it because I think that it is a unique area. But that being said, the conversation became more about 
we need lot sizes. We need to put lot sizes in the different areas and we need to make sure that they're conform to what's going on in those areas. And in the January, if I'm correct, if I remember right, in the January zoning meeting, uh, zoning did a great job of bringing that forward and actually had some parameters that they were working with that would have worked. I believe Mr. Solis took it off the table because not one citizen from that area came up and said, yeah, we wanna make sure our lot sizes are protected. Then the next thing I see is this particular RR zoning. Now, if we have the RR zoning, if somebody's inside that area uh, that becomes RR, how difficult is it for them to uh, uh, change anything on their property uh, if, you know, take it through zoning for something else down the future? And I'm thinking about McGinsky Park. Do they have to bring it back to zoning or is it just a given that it's, it's nixed from here and ever after? Or are there any flexibilities when that, within that RR? If that's a question for me, Mr. Paul. Yes. Um, I, I will tell you that any property owner can bring a request to the zoning commission for a change in zoning um, or for a special use permit um, or uh, seek a variance from the board of adjustment as to something involving their land. Uh, and it would be handled through the ordinary process that the city follows in those instances. Um, uh, that someone could also initiate a application for a change in zoning. If the, if, if the, the action after all the zoning commission public hearings and city council public hearing or public hearings results in rezoning all of the land shown in the red boundary on the map to RR, there's nothing to stop an individual owner from at a later date seeking to change the zoning of their property, having been rezoned to RR, change it to something else. Um, for the most part, the regulations in the RR district are the same as in the single family A district with the exceptions of lot size and setbacks. For the most part, everything else is pretty much the same. Um, and and um, uh, your observation about the work of the Zoning Commission, particularly in January, uh, was to focus on the lot size issue. And I believe it was Zoning Commissioner McCormick who made the, the, ult the recommendation that was ultimately accepted as to what the minimum lot size was going to be recommended for the RR district and that that recommendation ultimately uh, became part of the city ordinances when the council adopted it. Well, actually his lot size recommendations I believe were in fact just dealing with changing the lot sizes in the different area. And I'm talking about that specific meeting and Mr. McCormick's probably listening he can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but because nobody came forward to support that from that area, uh, Mr. Solis uh, rightfully said, well, it doesn't seem to be an interest in jumping forward with all this. So, uh, but regardless, uh, I know that that's what the new situation is. In the zoning, in the recent zoning meetings, one of the things that I was kind of curious about is it was almost like playing poker. At one zoning meeting, they wanted to have this XYZ in this district Next zoning meeting, they wanted to change it, wanted to put the, uh, a park in there, McGinsky Park in there. And it kind of, a, it was a fluid target, if you will. And so, so that's what kind of, it's kind of fluid with my thinking too. And that's why I was curious. If I can, Councilman, I, I think what you see is the work in progress, right? It's right. a little give and take. Public policy is all about get, get listening to the community and being able to reach a compromise. Uh, what the community brought forth was what they heard from the commissioners, the concern with the commercial areas, the concerns with the churches uh, and, and putting something over them that did not need to be there. They responded in time. You talk about the tango that we had to do. It was a dance, it was coming back and forth. So the fluidity that you saw is exactly that. But I will also tell you one other thing that is overarching and important to recognize, which we have lost in, 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 in I think in our nation 
And that is the trust in our, situ in our institutions, the trust that we have a variance, a, a board of adjustment, the trust that we have a zoning commission that we'll be able to listen, and the trust that we have the proper checks and balances in our laws today to be able to address what you rightly pro pointed out. Someone decides tomorrow that they wanna take two lots, buy it and do something. Well, there is a process for them to come forward. There is a process, they are not stuck. And this is not a communist country where it's just one size fits all and it's over. This has the checks and balances, we have that. And what I wanna be able to emphasize, I think, is having the trust back in our institutions. That's sometimes missed. And the fear that was came originally for the creation of the rural, rural, uh, rural residential district was because of the one-offs that have taken place over the years. Commissioner, I mean, uh, Councilman Joyce and I had to deal with the bases when it, came, it tried to come in. And there were a lot of other one-offs that came up. <laughs> this made sense that we had trust in our, in our public hearings. We had trust in our zoning commission. We have trust uh, in our institutions that are there to answer any property owner's concern. Well, then, then I go back to a basic question of if we can change the lot sizes in the different areas to be relative to those areas, then why are we even worry about going to an RR if in fact you can do the same things in the RR that you can right now, I mean, excuse me, uh, that you can right now in the uh, single uh, A district. If, you, if all the flexibility is still there, why are we going through the process as opposed to just, let's change the lot sizes, which was, and that's where I'm getting Sure, I understand. I, I think when this council adopted the rural residential district uh, back in your last meetings, uh, it, it indicated to me uh, concurrence with what the zoning commission had also seen, what the community had requested it, is an opportunity for us to set a standard, if you will, uh, an expectation for this one particular part of Castle Hills that, as you've heard, preserves the ambiance, uh, the, the, the different type of community that exists, uh, and, and that's what we wanted to preserve. So, yeah, it, it does kind of get really close to, to how things go, but, you know, that's public policy, and we were very happy to be able to work with the community one-on-one -on -one, uh, and listening, and they responded in tandem. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor. Mr. McCormick. Uh, yes, may I address Mr. Paul's comments and one by Mr. Joyce? Yes, sir. Uh, let me mention, first of all, that there was a considerable discussion over the lot size issue. And essentially, it came down to one major fact, and that is that, that the properties over there are all on septic systems. And state law now requires uh, a substantial amount of property to support a septic drain field. And for the most part, that means that the, 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 drain, the property necessary to support a drain field after you take into consideration setbacks and that sort of thing is going to be about 0.7 acres total, which is why we came up with the land area that we did. So, Mr. Joyce, I think your comment about being able to make multiple lots out of all of those one acre lots or 1.2 acre lots along uh, the side of McGimsey Park. Probably you can't make two lots out of those because we won't be able to support septic systems on them. So that, that's one issue. The second issue, Mr. Paul, is that the reason it's important to do this now is that the A residential lot size is, as I recall it, 14,000 or so square feet. Now on that size lot, you can't support a septic system. There's no public sewage available, uh, service available over on that side of West Avenue and uh, Northwest Military right now. So it, putting, it, putting in new houses and that sort of thing would require that we install a septic system. The other thing is that we have, we have set a minimum or a maximum of uh, impermeable cover in the RR district of 35%. Now, what the reason for that is because that area has a substantial drainage problem, and that drainage all drains off into the creek, which which provides a substantial runoff downstream behind the other properties along Fox Hall and, and Fox Lane, and that's that sort of thing. So that would create a drainage problem if we put a substantial amount of concrete driveways and streets over on McGimsey Park. 
if we delay until McGimsey Park is ready to develop and they file their development before we take the time to do two public hearings and a couple of public hearing, a public public hearing and another hearing with the city council and get zoning changed, that would be too late. And so while we may be able to go back and get a a a change in the lot size or something like that in a specific case, it's not it's not use not really appropriate for us to delay now rather than to go ahead and, and act on this. It doesn't, it doesn't take it away anyone's rights. It doesn't have any impact on any of the people over there immediately. And there's nothing that would prevent us from going ahead with it. I think, I think delaying is a poor choice. It's kicking the can downstream rather than having to make a decision now. And the fact is we're not making a decision at this moment. All we're doing is making a decision to go ahead and look at this and ask the people to tell us what they think. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Okay, uh, with that being said, we'll take a vote. All in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, Mayor, is there a motion? No, you, everybody beat me to it. Do we have a motion? Mr. May. Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm not gonna belabor it, but I do want the record re to reflect that earlier today I consulted uh, with the city attorney. I was afraid that I couldn't participate tonight or vote uh, because we have two properties. And he assured me that on this particular issue, I can take part and I can vote. It's somewhat further down in the agenda where I, I'm gonna have to abstain. But I wanna make it very clear. I support the rural district idea. I support this resolution. I intend to vote for it. Uh, I do have some shared concerns, however, that uh, Councilman Joyce has already articulated uh, I'm a little concerned about in the quest for finding control uh, of the property, particularly the park that may be developed, we should not handcuff uh, future generations. I think all of us here in this room can imagine what it'd be like if we actually had a large preserved park for all time or estate sized parcels that could be developed in a manner that would it would reflect what already exists in, in our uh, proposed rural district. Uh, with that being said, I propose the city council uh, adopt resolution 2021-05-18. Second. Thank you, Mr. May. Second by Mr. Isbrand. May we comment before we vote? Yes, sir. Um, I, I'd just like to echo the sentiment of my colleagues here. I think it was a wonderful idea to bring rural residential designation up. And I think there's very good work that has been done here. I think there is still some apprehension on our part that's been characterized here tonight. And I look forward to what you will bring back after these public hearings take place. And I hope that we will hear from McGimsey along the way too. They're not a small landowner here. And I think that we at least owe that, but recognizing that what we're doing tonight is basically giving the thumbs up to continue forward with that. I think that's a very acceptable place to be. And again, I appreciate all the effort that everybody has put into this. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, council. Thank you, uh, the commission for your help and for the residents that have spent so much time with us. I know it's been a labor of love. Uh, next up, we have item 6.7, public hearing on the amendments to section 50-61. And uh, let's see, um, yeah, 50-61 and 50-391 to modify existing limitations on habitable accessory units in the A single family zoning district and in the RR rural residential zoning district to allow rentals under certain conditions. Mr. Rapley. Mayor. Public hearing. I'm sorry. It is uh, 734 and we're going to open the public hearing. I don't believe we have anybody signed up. Would anybody like to speak? I believe Mr. McCormick has signed up to speak. I don't have him on this item. Mr. McCormick, would you like to speak? We wait for the comments. Mr. McCormick, are you there? We can't hear you. Uh, yes, I'm here and I can uh, I can speak now if you like or I can wait until the discussion section, whichever, whichever is appropriate. I'm sorry, Mr. McCormick, we can't hear you. 
Okay, there we go. That's because I have my mic tipped up. Um, I can speak now or I can speak during the discussion section. If you like me to go ahead, I'll do it now. You can go now, sir. Okay, uh, this was uh, recommended for denial by the uh, Zoning Commission and based essentially on a couple on, on two items that I know of for sure. One of them is traffic in the uh, rural residential area and population density in the rural residential area. One of the reasons that the rural residential area was recommended by the uh, city, by the zoning commission is to uh, provide some limitation on population density and to prevent traffic from getting out of control in the rural residential area. As you may know, or probably all of you do, that, that the streets in, in the rural residential area, the proposed rural residential area, are for the most part only 20 feet wide. And in, that, in fact, there are some places where they're only 16 feet wide. Um, there, that means that there is no place for on-street parking. There is barely space for, for cars to pass each other going opposite directions. And in some places that really is, is really marginal. So uh, the problem of having additional traffic in that area is, is a significant one. Uh, the other is that the fact is that at the moment, all of these properties are zoned single family residential. And uh, there, there's been some notice of the fact that, that rental properties tend in general to reduce the, the property values of surrounding properties because rental properties generally are not as well maintained as properties that are uh, owner occupied and where they have some, some more pride of ownership of the property and take better care of their, of their land and, and the appearance of the, of the property itself. So uh, for those reasons, uh, in both areas, the uh, A single family residential and the RR uh, rural residential zoning district, the zoning commission uh, voted to deny uh, this recommendation. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Do we have anybody else that would like to speak? Okay, we will close the public hearing at 737 and proceed to item 6.8, discussion of possible action on ordinance number 2021-05-18-B regarding possible amendments to section 5-61 and 50-391 of the code of ordinances to allow rental of habitable accessory buildings under certain conditions. Chairman Solis, good to see you. Mayor and Council, I need some clarification. Um, well, with all respect to my colleague, Mr. McCormick, there was an inter interaction of personal opinion as well as zoning commission uh, in his report to you all. Uh, the city, the zoning commission did not consider or take a statement in, in terms of saying that any appropriate, I mean, excuse me, any rental and those next door would then be devalued. That was not a position by the zoning commission. That's a personal opinion. I just wanna make sure we understand. I think it's important that we understand the bigger picture. And that was, Mr. McCormick was correct in a couple of areas. We talked about density in particular. We understood that what, it, what this allows for is for more people to then pop up another house, another unit within their property. Uh, again, I speak to the checks and balances that exist for that today. If you wanna do that, well, I really suppose you need an SUP or a change in your zoning to be able to allow that. So I think it's important that what we looked at this, uh, this request that was brought to us uh, was the fact that the concern was exactly as Mr. McCormick talks, density and traffic. And that was a recommendation for denial, Mayor. Thank you, Chairman. Mm -hmm. Council? For discussion, I guess we need to have a motion. I move that we accept the recommendation of zoning. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I'll second. A second by Mr. Joyce. Mr. Paul, discussion? I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Solis, uh, why, why did, why was, who brought this forward, the zoning, why did it show up? Was there some issues going on? <laughs> um, Interesting question, I know. <laughs> you know, Mr. Paul, uh, Councilman, that has been something that I've had a difficulty when things come to for us uh, that don't come with the public mandate. Uh, we are working with that, and that is something that we're trying to address with zoning. This was brought forth uh, that came to our agenda, so we addressed it accordingly sure 
I knew somebody had to bring you. You wouldn't just flick it out of the air for that is correct. for conversation. And, and so one of the things that we're working towards is creating, as we have now for our zoning commission, uh, a public hearing, which allows us then to help people understand, you know, should we, because one person can't come forward and all of a sudden take it all the way, utilizing city staff, utilizing our time, your time, uh, without a public mandate, I have trouble with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bone, Mr. Isbrand. Since Chairman Solis is still there, you can't, yes, get, can't get steps in just <laughs> yet. I know, right? <laughs> okay, I, I heard conversation about rural residential district here. I didn't hear anything said about uh, residential A. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on that, please? It's on both areas. It's absolutely. What's important for us, you go back to the designation single family. What this allows for is more than one family, uh, especially if you do the rent. And that was, that was something for us that was of concern. Um, and, and something we felt that was not uh, something that had a mandate for people in Castle Hills to be able to do that. We had already taken the issue with those for um, density in reference to um, the Airbnb opportunities, right? We, we took that zoning, zoning's already addressed that. You all have adopted that already. Uh, and it was our concern that we saw some of the same lines uh, a connection or compatibility with that. And so we want to be consistent. And I think it was a consistent that we made the decision uh, reducing the opportunity uh, for people to have an Airbnb. Uh, and so we think this was just another attempt to make that happen. Um, and I appreciate that and that notion of consistency. I just want to make sure I understand the, the thought process that went through all this. Because I think coming into this tonight, I could see particularly in single family A district where you have much smaller lots, that there would be much more opposition to this. And that's why I was intrigued to hear us talk about rural residential and to get a sense of in the course of your commission hearings on this, um, what was the magnitude of the voice that came from rural residential versus single family Okay. Um, you know, the fact that the, you know, because of the agenda items that were there, we tended to hear more for the rural residential district because they were there uh, majority of the times. But again, uh, was there a public mandate to try to get this passed by zoning committee? There was not. Uh, it was, it came to our agenda. We did the proper notifications. It was properly notified, you know, as an agenda item for us to discussion. We had the discussion. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, sir. Council, any further discussion? I do have one quick question. What, what, what exactly constitutes a rental? Is that any rental or is that less than 30 days, more than 30 Our days? Our interpretation was anybody who paid uh, a fee for living there uh, and, and then created a contract. So one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. What would happen to somebody that has the back house rented out? Um, given this, are they grandfathered in? That would be Mr. Schnall, and I would believe they would be. Mark? Um, they would be only if that rental was legal at the time it was made. So, so if somebody presently has somebody renting, it will be stay renting. Got you. And then once that renter- No, sir. Excuse me, Mayor. No, that's not correct. Right now, the sections that are under consideration here, 50-61A and 50-391A, talk about the use of an habitable accessory building. 50-61A um, is in the A district and 50-391A is in the RR district. And, and the wording of those two provisions as they stand today, basically say you can't rent a habitable accessory building for compensation. And you can use them for certain specified reasons that apparently have been in the zoning code forever, but they, they specifically do not a, a, appear to approve rental for compensation. And the, the proposed amendment would allow um, limited rentals um, as long as the, the other property, the other structure on the property was owner occupied. Well, that puts a whole new light on this, I would think. Yeah, can we take a step back there, Mr. Snow, um, and, and clarify it? So this recommendation to zoning was to allow rentals of habitable accessory buildings under certain conditions, is that correct? That was, 
there wasn't a recommendation to the zoning commission. That was an option the zoning commission had. Um, and as both Mr. McCormick and Chairman Solis have said, the zoning commission voted not to do that. Okay, so up for on the our council agenda, is that to, um, I guess, vote an acceptance of the zoning commission's recommendation? No, the, the, the proposed resolution, the proposed ordinance um, is essentially the ordinance that the Zoning Commission did not recommend. They denied to recommend that language. But, but that's, the, that's the, the, the action that came from the origin of this item was to um, not prohibit the rental of a habitable accessory building under certain conditions. Okay. And, and the condition was that, that the other structure be owner occupied, um, which I think was a reflection of one of the comments Mr. McCormick made about uh, the maintenance of a, a totally rented property versus a, the maintenance and appearance of a, a property that's partially owner occupied. But clearly the zoning commission considered all of the above and voted to deny that change. In, in most instances, what issues that come for the, from the zoning commission are approval and you have everything in front of you and then you just hear our recommendation above it. In this instance, the recommendation was there and the ordinance was there and the zoning commission has said deny. And so we're saying no to the ordinance uh, and we're asking for your concurrence. Mr. Gregory. As the law presently stands, correct me, Mr. Snow, if I'm wrong, you cannot rent something on your property for a residential rental or um, these people who come into town for a few weeks and then leave. So we do not allow renting property on your property, even though you may be in another building, even though if it's on your land, is that correct? No, it's only if it's an accessor, if, if it's a, an accessory, a habitable accessory building. Um, so, so there can be rentals of other things, but, but this language in these two subsections of the code are about habitable accessory buildings. Yes, I can think of several places in the city where people have been renting in a habitable accessory building for years. Well, it depends on what zoning district they're in. These two uh, sections cited in this agenda item are in the A district and in the RR district. Nobody's renting anything in the RR district because there's nothing in the RR district now. Lord. This does not, the language currently would not prohibit renting a garage um, or a carriage house um, unless they were defined when they met the definition of a habitable accessory building. Um, but um, I can only tell you what our ordinances currently say. Um, and, and that's maybe why this was brought to the zoning commission to look at this and make a recommendation. And the zoning commission has looked at it and made a recommendation. This is not so cut and dry, I don't think, as it appeared. No, sir. It seems like there's a history within the ordinances of the past yes. um, that have not been all the way combed through, if you will, uh, for us to be consistent on all phases. This is one was just brought forth to us. So we were able to address the incoming rural residential district as well as single A. So, Mr. Solis, that being said, would you be feel more comfortable as the chairman to review it in its entirety? Uh, that would, again, if we go into those unfunded mandates, those mandates that all of a sudden come out of nowhere for us to go back through that. Uh, if there's a mandate for us to do that, uh, is that a council directive? Then that's what you all are able to do, right? You take a vote and say, hey, uh, we'd like for you to consider the rest of the of the area, then we can't. That's not Well, I do know there's not... certain areas in this city that will, people will be definitively impacted by this. As long as they're single A, it, it, again, that's why we denied it. 
Mr. Mayor, can I offer a comment? Sure, Mr. McCormick. Um, we had a couple of hearings on this, and I want to point out that at the hearings, we had a grand total of, I believe it was five people who uh, came and offered their testimony at the public hearing. Uh, of those five people, four of them were residents in the proposed RR district. Only one was in the uh, uh, a residential, single family residential district, and nobody, nobody appeared to, in support of this proposed uh, ordinance. And um, that, among other things, I believe to be the reason that the Zoning Commission uh, denied it unanimously. Thank you, sir. Do, Mr. Gregory. Mr. Isbrand. I, it's, I, I, I'm still not sure I understand all this because we speak in double negatives on what's there, what's not there, acting to deny versus whatever. I'm wondering if you can help a very simple mind like mine go through this process. So the way the, the code for the city currently exists, what is permissible? Mark? I'd ask Mark to give you the definitive um, answer. I, I would ask Mr. Rapley to pull the, the zoning ordinance those two sections and read them to the governing body. I thought I had a copy here with me, but I don't seem to have it right now. I may just go off video for a moment and see if I can find a copy um, in my home office. So let me do that. And uh, meantime, if Mr. Rapley could find that and read that to the governing body in case I can't find it. Um, but I just need to be off for about 30 seconds. Mr. Gregory, I can't hear you. Can you use your microphone? Can a motion be offered to send this back to zoning for reconsideration and re-vote and re-clarification? I believe so. I'll uh, defer to Mr. Schnall, legally speaking, but I believe that's acceptable. Do we, we, we don't currently have a motion on the table, do we, or do we? Mr. We Paul, do. I think made a okay. motion. Thank you. And, and I, I, I don't want to particularly drag this out forever, but again, I think there's sort of these double negatives of you don't deny this, which prevented this, or you approve this, which denied this kind of thing. And the complexity of this may be worth taking that little bit of extra time to make sure that there is a thorough understanding of this. Um, there's at, not an issue with that. We would, we would have no problem with that. I, I think, you know, another motion that y'all can do would be to table it, it pending further information uh, provided by our attorney who's ready with his right hand up. Mr. Schnall, yes, sir. Okay, so this is exactly what section 50-61A says. It's, uh, it's, it's captioned use regulations and subsection A says, generally in the A single family dwelling district, no land shall be used and no building shall be erected for or converted to any use other than single family residences and accessory buildings and structures usual and customary to permitted uses in this district when meeting the requirements of section 50-36F. This is the sentence that I was referring to a few minutes ago, the coming sentence, this next sentence. The section then says, habitable accessory uses shall not be rented, but may be occupied by occasional non-paying guests and by full-time employees living on the premises who function as domestic help or caregivers. Uh, and I, I apologize to Mr. Isbrand about the negative, the, the double negatives. It's, it's a function of the uh, unusual situation, but that's the sentence that caught someone's attention. The, the sentence that says, habitable accessory uses shall not be rented, but may be occupied by occasional non-paying guests and by full-time employees living on the premises who function as domestic help or caregivers. Um, this doesn't change any of the comments and, and, and summaries that both Mr. McCormick and Chairman Solis gave, but I hope that gives you the context of, of this issue. And so the comment I made earlier that a habitable accessory building cannot be rented for compensation, 
consistent with Mr. Solis's comment, I, I do believe is accurate based on the reading of this sentence from 50-61A. Thank you, Mr. Schnell, I appreciate that. Does thank that help? You. Yeah, it does, Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Council. We stand by our recommendation. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> okay, we have a motion on the table. Uh, before we proceed with the vote, I wanna make sure nobody wants to withdraw their motion. Mr. Joyce, you... I just wanna make sure that the, that the motion is to accept the Zoning Commission recommendation to deny this suggestion. Yes, sir. That's the way I understand it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have a motion on the table. Uh, all in favor? All opposed? Abstaining? Mr. Mayor, I've already executed a conflict of interest affidavit earlier today. Okay. Thank you, Mr. May. Uh, so Mr. May will be abstaining and the motion passes. Okay, we will proceed to item number 6.9, discussion of possible action on a resolution 2021-05-18-A, authorizes the City of Castle Hills to enter into an interlocal agreement with the City of San Antonio to establish concurrent jurisdiction and authorize the City Manager to execute the interlocal agreement, Chief Zuniga. Mayor, Council. Um, this agreement um, was submitted into San Antonio for a renewal late last year by Chief Siemens um, due to the uh, current events that had been occurring throughout the country. Uh, San Antonio had kind of been uh, stalling some of these um, agenda summaries that they had or agendas that they had uh, present before their council. They finally uh, moved forward and uh, approved it on their end. And so we're seeking tonight to get this uh, MOU, if you will, uh, renewed and allow for patrol and enforcement of, of the boundary streets of Castle Wills, which includes Jackson Keller, uh, Blanco, and Lock Hill Selma. Thank you, Chief. Mayor. Mr. Isbrand. Mayor, I'd move approval of resolution 2021-05-18A regarding a local interlocal cooperation agreement with the city of San Antonio. Second. Thank you, Mr. Isbrand. Second by Mr. May. Uh, Chief Zuniga is far too modest to admit this, but uh, this was something that was brought to the state by the city of Castle Hills in SB 631, offered to all municipalities throughout the state of Texas. And it's contingent on them to seek MOUs with their neighboring cities to get approval. Um, I helped Chief work on this, getting this brought to the, the front of the city of San Antonio's agenda. And one thing that I learned is that not all cities were allowed to continue. Uh, some of the cities were going a little bit too outside, too far outside of their boundaries. And uh, those will not be likely getting their MOUs renewed. And the fact that we have uh, such great officers that are held to a high standard and doing the job the way it's supposed to be done, ours is getting renewed. And, that's, that's correct, um, sir. Just uh, uh, basically, we didn't abuse the uh, the bill. Yes, sir. Um, so again, Chief, thank you so much, and for all the officers on the street doing what they do best. Thank you, yes, sir. Mr. Gregory. Does this mean San Antonio can come into the streets of Castle Hills and pursue somebody? Pursue, yes, sir. Now, that's always that's been standing all the time. If, if you're talking about a traffic violation and they're coming into Castle Hills, yes, sir. Just as if there's a violation that's observed in Castle Hills, we pursue into other jurisdictions. What do they observe a, a violation in Castle Hills? They typically do not. Uh, but can they now? Uh, if this is passed, basically what they do, what what happens is. Uh, I have not seen yet, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, that if an infraction occurs in the city, I've never seen that they actually enforce anything here. They pretty much stay within their boundaries uh, in San Antonio. Thank you. For what it's worth, a, a Texas police officer, which is a peace officer, is practice almost anywhere within the state, but they have the jurisdictions that they should stay in, correct? That is correct. Uh, as a peace officer, we have jurisdiction throughout the state, like the mayor said. Uh, the, the question is more the court jurisdiction, really, uh, not so much the 
the, the police department, the police officers. Okay, uh, any further discussions? All in favor? Unanimous, thank you so much, Chief. Thank you. Okay, item uh, number 10, discussion and update from a comprehensive plan advisory committee on progress to date and discussion and possible action on steps, including possible engagement of consultant, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Y'all may recall that over the last few months, I've been from time to time giving little tidbits of what the, the committee has been up to. And uh, tonight, we're gonna get a full report from uh, Ms. McLean, who is our chair and she'll be highlighting the uh, survey results. She'll walk us through the proposed process and schedule that we've come up with. Uh, we'll re renew, we'll look at what we call neighborhood visualization points. And then finally propose that we engage a consultant to enable us to produce the best comprehensive plan possible. So we ask that you give your full consideration to this request and whenever Ms. McLean is ready. All right, good evening. I'm Amy McLean. My address is 105 Villa Ann, just for the record. Um, and I'm the chairman of CPAC. Thank you for the honor to speak in front of you, Mayor and Council this evening, City Manager. Um, this committee has been hard at work since last August. Um, we deliberately got a really slow start. In your packet for the agenda tonight, you received kind of an update. It's about a three page paper that I have broken up into some slides that are a little bit more visual for discussion this evening. You also have a draft kind of a teaser of our table of contents for the um, comp plan and you have the updated LNV contract from May 12th, 2011. That's all in your packet. Um, but my presentation this evening, um, we have we have adopted um, the theme that we are creating Castle Hills. So Create Castle Hills is sort of our byline for this project that we're going through. And, and we are determining our future excellence. We decided to focus short, sweet, tight words, um, kind of keep us inspired. The um, CPAC or Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee is composed of myself, the chair, Moretta Scott, who is the vice chair. Um, Mr. Or Alderman Joyce is our council representative. Um, Skip McCormick is one of our parks liaison. Ray Schultz is our other parks and project liaison. Then we also have Barry Middleman, Agdell Rivera, Bruce Smiley Califf, and Stacia Sprigden who are on the committee. So there are nine, nine of us. It's a very tight um, group. We have one hour meetings every two weeks and we start at noon and we end at one. And it's amazing um, the amount of work that we can get done. And if we don't finish, we just move it to the next meeting. We adopted a mission, and this took us a while, um, but we were very intentional with what we adopted. The purpose of our committee, we determined, is to, with the input from Castle Hill citizens, businesses, city staff, and council, to produce a roadmap for economic development and the care, maintenance, and growth of our city's infrastructure, facilities, green spaces, and services for the future. We feel as a committee that it is extremely important that we talk to all the stakeholders. And so all the stakeholders would be the citizens, the businesses, the staff, and you as council, and of course, all of the um, members of our commissions, we, we kind of rolled those into city um, Castle Hill citizens. Currently, Castle Hills has a vision statement. It was adopted several years ago as part of a strategic plan, and this is in, um, in your paper in the document, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. We think very, um, it, we think it's very important that this plan that we produce be citizen focused. It is absolutely our top priority because, as you see, every area of town that we have has different um, needs and desires and has a different essence. As Dr. And Mrs. Ackley pointed out, I liked her use of the word the essence of our different neighborhoods. We want to create a roadmap. This is not something that will necessarily tie future council's hands. This is a roadmap to help council, to help zoning, to help board of adjustments, to help all of our cities, committees, commissions do their jobs by obtaining citizen input, putting it in a document that then can be referred to. You know, what are the different parts of town looking at? What do they feel is important? What do they think the threats are? One of our other important goals is we want to improve community health and safety. 
because that's one of our jobs as a city is to look out for the health and safety of our residents. Um, we also want to incorporate a unified vision for the city as a whole, but we recognize that each of our six distinct neighborhoods have very, very different characters and essences, which if you look at the whole, we do have one broad kind of um, global atmosphere, but every area is different and we can't seek to impose what um, one area values on another area. So that's very important to us as a committee. We feel also that it is very important that we use all the previous studies, all the previous plans, all of the different work that has been done by various other people through the history of the city in considering our plan because so many other committees have been started, stopped, and there has been a lot of wasted time, um, citizen time and other, other people's time. We want it to be a mostly in-house effort, but we don't possess all the skills necessary to produce an effective and great document. In the end, we want it to be attractive, easily readable, and accessible. So this would be something we post on the website and it can constantly be updated as it's changed over time. We want to include amendment mechanisms so we don't ever have to go back and start from scratch. This has been a laborious process and, and we're all enjoying it, but we don't necessarily feel like as a city we need to go through this process every time. If we create the proper document, then councils now or in the future will be able to amend it based on what our citizens are feeling and needing and wanting and what's threatening them at those times in the future. We also want to create some assessment and implementation mechanisms because why have it if we're not actually going to use it, but then we need to know whether it's effective. So we will have some assessment and implementation mechanisms in there to create some accountability so that we haven't wasted time and you all aren't wasting time. And like I said, we want to avoid starting from scratch. So these are very, very important. We think about these with every different part of the process we go through. Okay, so what we have done already, we formed our team, we've um, done a lot of, of minute planning and discussions to get to this point. We have requested, we've, we've presented to the Parks Commission and, and asked for funding, and they gave us a recommendation, and so now we are here before you as council to basically ask for money so that we can continue with our process. Okay, a little bit about the citizen survey because this is the most important thing that we have really done to date. We have 1,760 households in Castle Hills which received a postcard advising them that there was this survey that they could do on SurveyMonkey or they could get a physical copy and turn it into City Hall. We had 240 households respond. That is 13.63%, which is considered statistically significant. When we have mentioned these numbers to other people that are, have done surveys, they were astounded by the percentage of, of responses we had. So we have a vested citizen input, uh, vested citizen, invested citizenry in this process. We also had 57 people offer to help. And of those 57 people, they are scattered throughout our six neighborhoods. And they are not the normal people that have been, been involved in the city process. These are new faces to city involvement. So we were really excited to see and kind of sad to see that some people hadn't said yes. Um, you know, people that we are used to being involved in city activities. But we have new engagement with 57 they weren't all new, but 57 people interested in helping, which is great. And then we'll have more information to come. Um, statistically speaking, we had roughly equal responses from our six different neighborhoods. They were higher in some areas and lower in others, but generally speaking, they were pretty equal. And we have numerous people in each area that are willing to help. So we feel like it's great that we've got um, pretty equal disbursement through the city for going through this process. What we are currently in the process of doing besides asking you all for money this evening is maybe getting this to go. We are working on information to post on the city website. We're recruiting our neighborhood teams and we are working on a kind of a poll that we're going to do with city staff and city council regarding your specific input uh, so that we can incorporate, the, incorporate that in and take care of that part of our mission. What's next is really the exciting part and why we're here asking for money to hire some professionals. 
we have come up with the concept that in order to further develop our citizen input, that we are going to host speaker forums in the summer on these topics from everything from economic development to green spaces and green spines, which is a new term that I've learned of recently, commercial and residential um, development, crime and security and emergency preparedness, aging in place, which is, um, we have learned is pretty important through the pandemic and through our recent freeze, and education schools and zoning. Um, what we've determined from some of the survey responses is that a lot of people don't really understand zoning and they don't really understand infrastructure. When we use the term infrastructure, it's a little bit confusing about what that is. So we are in the process of lining up speakers and um, it will be an extremely dynamic group of people that we have to help present information and inform people. The idea at this point in the process is that our professionals would provide us with the best examples from other cities on these topics. So it gets our citizens and gets us as leaders in the community engaged in thinking about what we can be in the future. It doesn't mean that's where we're headed. It just means that they would provide us with some pictures of what are green spines, what, how can you do commercial development and still be sensitive to residential development. The next phase of the process would kind of distill it down. This would probably involve special meetings with different neighborhoods because we do have extremely diverse needs between our neighborhoods. And then there would be a third series of workshops that would further um, kind of hone in on what we will have in the plan. As we get into our idea workshops, that's where we would have our professionals take the input from the forums. You know, if citizens say, we want parks with you know, dog parks, they could come back in and in an idea workshop, show us what a plan of a dog park might lo look like and where it would be in our city. So we go from very broad um, visualizations into attaching it to our city and visualizing for ourselves. And then as we get into priority wor workshops, we would really ask citizens, you know, where are our priorities? Are parks our priorities? Are um, public works are priorities, you know, where, where are they falling in the process, or do we think they're all equal, so how do we do it all? What we are really excited about is, um, well, and then to get us to the finish line, we would develop a draft document, have reviews, again, having citizen input, updating plans with comments, presenting it to council, and then that would lead to the development of a CIP for the city that would, hopefully, we'll get to that point by the end of the year, and go into 2022 with a comprehensive plan. So this is really exciting. We have as a committee created some neighborhood visualization points to really drive home an idea of how our neighborhoods are so different and why it's important for us to use LNV and LPA to help us with this process. First of all, we have WOW or West of West. And sort of the three things that we've come up with is to have our professionals analyze the benefits and challenges of the rural residential zoning, to provide potential suggestions on strategic rezoning or dual zoning, because there is mixed commercial use along West Avenue and there's a lack of sidewalks. So help us figure out what that could look like. How can we all, um, how can we make things work and not create tension between different uses? How can we, um, create the synergy that that part of town wants, but at the same time give people the flexibility to use their properties and then analyze St. George's traffic because it has a pretty pretty big impact in that area when it's school time. And you can see west of west is the red area. Um, thank you to Mr. Schultz for creating our visualization of our six neighborhoods with the colors. He, he spent quite a bit of time doing that for us. So that's what we visualize as three priorities, but I know that neighborhood will have more things that they want. The edge is the area off of Lock Hill Selma between Lock Hill Selma and Northwest Military. It's in blue. They, um, we hear a lot of comments from them about cut through traffic. And um, so traffic impact is a huge issue in that area. So we would have our professionals look at how can we be creative in dealing with the issues they talk about. Also develop some um, exhibits for possibly converting part of that concrete drainage channel into some sort of linear park or a green spine. And I'll show you a picture of a green spine in a minute. It's one of my new favorite kind of city words. 
or development words, and then address oak wilt because that part of town is um, experiencing a huge problem with oak wilt and we know that Castle Hills values our trees. It's probably the global overarching um, identity that we have as our trees, but they have a huge problem with the health of their trees. So create some exhibits regarding that. Then we have Midtown. Midtown is the area where we are right now, City Hall, it's, it's lined in black. Here we have some unique situations. We've got larger lots, um, no curb and gutter. So we would use professional exhibit to ex exhibits to explore the idea of walkability, bikeability through perhaps drainage channels or um, landscaping of a turn lane on Northwest Military. Um, there are Northwest Military issues, so those might be issues that this area would want to see pictures of. Develop exhibits for, oh, I said drainage channels to a linear park. Um, also, beautification of the shopping centers, maybe creating a way that everything looks cohesive. So as you drive down Northwest Military, you have a wow factor of, wow, I'm in this beautiful city and this is clearly a um, kind of a little maybe business heart of the city, even though most of our city services are over here off of um, Honeysuckle and Lemonwood. The estates, we're moving to the southern or the southern loop now. We have Nolo and Solo. So the southern loop has three areas also. The estates is bordered in pink. We would look at perhaps possible additions of sidewalks along properties that, that border Blanco and Honeysuckle. There are a couple of houses right in there, including mine, that has no sidewalks along Blanco. Um, consider traffic control. We know as we're leaving our neighborhood, you do not go until you've looked both ways at least for 15 seconds because people run that light all the time. So that's an issue that we know in our area that would be interesting to look at. Develop exhibits for noise, bar noise barriers. Um, we are farther away from 410, but there is still some noise issue. And if we're looking into the future and thinking about the future and planning, then that might be a consideration for this area of town as well. The terrace is on the opposite side of Honeysuckle kind of all north of Antler, and this is bordered in yellow. This area of town also has, I'm gonna start with the bottom, a, uh, develop exhibits for noise barriers. They are much closer to 410, and so noise is a big issue for those houses that are closer to 410 in this area. Also develop exhibits for ways to improve Jackson Keller, such as a linear park, maybe where the drainage channel is. Um, there is open drainage, which is pretty scary along Jackson Keller, which would be an interesting thing to address and maybe some strategic rezoning or dual zoning where the duplexes are along Jackson Keller. And these are not things we as a committee, we can think of the words, but we can't really come up with the visual to show people that it's not tearing down whole neighborhoods to, to build um, commercial developments. The final area of the city or the sixth area is the Southern Cone or SoCo, which is probably my favorite name out of all of them. They're the mint green at the very bottom. And this is an extremely unique part of town, probably as unique as WOW is. Um, this area has similar problems to Midtown where we've got areas of commercial development that aren't very cohesive. So how can we create cohesion to where you know that that's Castle Hills? Most people don't know it is that that little point down there by Nimitz Middle School. Most people don't know that that's Castle Hills. Um, show where sidewalks might be. There is a whole long area along Jackson Keller where there are no sidewalks. And so walkability in that part of town is sketchy at best. And then also possible, beautifica uh, possible beautification with landscaping, uniform architectural style. And these are all things that professionals can help us with. But you can see how unique some areas carry over and have similar needs and some are very different. So this is how we believe that LNV and LPA can help us optimize our efforts. We will have improved workshops. Um, their professionals are used to how to elicit input from people in an effective manner. And we could take six hours to get information that they could get out of, the, out of citizens in an hour with different workshops and other things that they can do. It will give us a huge, it'll be, give us access to a huge amount of resources. LPA, which is the um, architect that has been assigned to our project and the specific architect, um, Federico Cavazos, has already in meeting with him two or three times understands, well, and he's from San Antonio, understands what we're talking about and how unique Castle Hills is. So that I think is very important. Um, 
but they have offices in California too. So their worldview is a little bit broader than using someone who's just here in San Antonio and used to San Antonio or used to South Texas and, and Texas. Um, I think our end result will be better. We will have the, have access to people that will help us um, get better results from, you know, elicit better input and, and be more creative in our process and be a little bit more efficient because they know how to do things that we don't know how to do as a committee. There is an impact of not using l and and um, without funding, we will lose the opportunity to leverage all the hours that this committee and other committees have spent on, on working on comp plans and master plans for the city. We won't have exhibits of the same quality, and I'm getting ready to show you a few. They will not look like this, I guarantee, if we have to do this ourselves. Um, but really, first and foremost, I think that they will help us get better input and more input from the stakeholders that need to have, have um, a part in the process. So let's meet our team. Besides our nine members of CPAC, we have Byron Sandifer, who is the um, LNV contact, but there's a picture of Federico Cavazos, and um, he, re he really gets where we are. He's been involved in several other cities in San Antonio, Terrell Hills and Alamo Heights and some of their development. So if you're familiar with those, this didn't translate very nicely, but there are multiple offices in both Texas and California, just to give you visually an idea of how broad their scope is and what we would have access to. So here's what I'm excited about. They are, they are known for being able to get intense, in, intense community engagement. They have endless optimism and local knowledge. And those are three very important things. This is a slide um, from their presentation to the CPAC on different things that they do to help get citizen input, everything from activity mapping to virtual walkthroughs with VR headsets to doing kind of citizen day in the life of so that they get an idea of how we use our city. And maybe in seeing how we use our city, we can see how we could use our city if we planned a little bit better and they can help us with these things. This is a schematic that they drew for Terrell Hills when they were redoing their um, city hall, fire department, police station. I like the green and all the trees and, and it sings to me because we do like our trees in Castle Hills, but I always, what I liked too is how it marries all the different departments and they are in a space, but they also knew what they were dealing with in Terrell Hills and what the site looked like. So they worked with the city and what they had and um, they understand that there are limitations when it comes to working with cities. In kind of future planning, uh, City of Pleasanton is working on kind of a multi-use facility um, that involves like a rodeo event center and some flex tracks and some other things. And this is just a schematic that they had put together for their um, council to look at to give you an idea of what the graphics might look like with a professional's assistance. Oh, I don't want to go back. Okay, this is um, the big picture up at the top is a picture of what a green spine is. So a green spine is a green space, but it intertwines in little areas that maybe aren't big enough for a park, but it has some other purpose, a limited use of some sort. And so that gives you an idea of how they can use graphics to show us where we could fit little amenities into the city in conjunction with drainage work and other things that we're already doing. This is a, a schematic of how they used buffers. And I know buffers are a pretty big issue when we deal with residential backing up to commercial. And so these are additional schematics to kind of show you how they blend a street into um, you know, the topography with um, vegetation and other things to create beauty and screening so that everyone's interests are taken con into consideration. And this schematic shows you of um, how a screening is in this area. That's a big like warehouse in the background. And so this visual shows residents or stakeholders what the planting looks like and what it will look like in a few years so that you can visualize when you plant the little trees, you can't quite visualize what it'll look like in a few years. And so they can help us help our citizens and ourselves visualize what, you know, what something in the, at the start would look like later on. All right, so our funding request, the new contract from LNV and LPA is $115,100. That went up a little bit from the one we had from November. 
I understand that we have $30,000 that was set aside money in 2020 for planning and it was not used. So there's $30,000 on the table from last year's budget. $15,000 is estimated to be the amount that the value of donated professional time for a feasibility study for City Hall. And in my presentation to the Parks and Projects Commission, they have authorized me to come to council and ask for $55,000 of the contract bid um, for use towards the comprehensive plan. That was approved, that ask was approved by the Parks Commission in March. That leaves $15,100 unaccounted for between my ask and the other uh, money that's on the table or donated time. And so between the donated time, the money on the table from last year's budget, it's $70,100 that is really needed to fulfill the obligation with the LNV um, LPA contract that's been presented to us for help with this project. But here's the bonus to city council. We have nine people on our committee and we estimate that the value of our time through this whole process until we finish it is gonna be somewhere between 200 and $300,000. You're dealing with nine professionals whose time, if they were working in work, maybe averages about $300 an hour. So we're talking about anywhere, each one of us giving something between 74 and over 100 hours a person to work on this and bring it to fruition. So while $115,000 sounds like a lot of money, we're double or tripling that with the amount of work that we're putting into this project. Smaller cities typically spend two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 to do a comprehensive plan, and the nine volunteers on this committee have offered to do two-thirds of that work. Um, we're proposing to spend, you know, basically a third of what it would cost to do a comp plan um, and donate all the rest of the fill the gap with our time and energy. So kind of our theme is to live, um, live, work, play, grow. That's how the table of contents that you've got as a teaser in your packet is set up, that we've divided everything into living, working, playing, and growing as kind of a, a organic way to look at our comprehensive plan. And um, that is my presentation for this evening. Does anyone have any questions for me? Council? Mr. May. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, you've done an excellent presentation and job and you have the dream committee. Every person on that committee has contributed to this city and probably knows it inside and out. Um, I think that we really must go forward with this plan. And I think the biggest question in, in every person's mind on this dais is will this take monies away that are essential uh, for functioning, uh, given the fact that we've had re revenue losses? That's the question. Okay, thank, thank you for um, asking that because that was supposed to be my final comment about where to get the money from and I forgot that. Um, we do have the seed fund and I know that that's sort of a sacred cow for the city um, and it's dwindled over the years, but that money was given to the city by CPS numerous years ago and it's supposed to be for community use and sustainability. And we feel like that that would be a good place to take the money from without affecting our city services. We certainly don't want to impact our city services at all, but we do have that pot of money and this would be a great way to give us the boost into the future that we need to have a great plan. So seed fund, that's my answer. Mr. Gregory. You all have done an enormous amount of work and it's clearly a very professional group of people. And it reminds me of the first people who did a comprehensive plan in 1998. They did a monumental work, didn't cost the city anything. And they had a lot of significant proposals for the city to consider doing, which a lot have been done through the years. The city is a thousand people smaller and it was then the revenue base per person has shrunk. And uh, here's here are several points I have to ask. The seed money, first of all, I was on the council when we got the seed money. The seed money, they also suggested strongly, although we didn't have to follow it, I guess, that it was to lower the carbon footprint of Castle Hills. That was the primary motivation of the seed money that came back. We had given that to CPS 
They basically just returned the money to us. But there was, of course, no way for, for the for city public service to find out what we were doing. So basically that hopeful injunction was eliminated. The seed fund, this $30,000, I, I can think of an extraordinarily better use for the seed money fund in, the, in which we would significantly reduce the cost of certain things. And that's solar paneling for the municipal buildings. You're having nothing but an upward spiral of energy costs over the last few years and solar panels as the telemarketers who called me constantly for the last several years would significantly reduce now and into the future the cost of energy that the city would have to do. So there is one thing right there that would have immediate savings to the city of a lot of money as time goes out, even though, and it's something that it should be considered. When this seed money originally came before us, I suggested we use the money for infrastructure. I was summarily dismissed and was told basically the council was to make up their wish list. That was my wish list. And we spent a lot of the money on infrastructure. Right now, even after we had borrowed $8 million, we're gonna still need, but in the ballpark of 20 more millions of dollars to fix basic infrastructure of flooding and streets. If we were like Alamo Heights who owns their own water system, or if we could put up the monstrosity that Alamo Heights has just put up on Austin Highway, which is gonna bring in an enormous amount of revenue, or if we were River Oaks, this would be a nonsense, really just a drop in the bucket of available funds, but we don't have that much. You're actually looking for over $100,000, not 30, because you talk about 70,100, but the total amount by the other institution is, I think, $101,000. So if we give 30, we have to follow it up by an additional 70. And to me, that type of commitment is a little steep, and especially considering we're about to go into the budget process. In the budget process, one key thing is, past councils have recognized the severe necessity of addressing infrastructure problems first. Drainage and street repair, first. That virtually all surplus money was to go directly into fixing infrastructure problems. That should, that should be, as many councils have said, the primary concern of the city. And I still believe it, considering we are going to be looking forward to many millions more that has to be spent. I, I think this is a very, it's a very beautiful project, but you've demonstrated to me that you know an enormous amount of what already needs to be done. I mean, the litany that you went through showed a comprehensive understanding of each particular section. So what we seem to be buying for $101,000 is, you get better uh, graphics. You bet, get better graphics to implore the people to support something. I've been around here a long time and I've seen <clears throat> no more than 200 people, maybe 300 at any one time ever come to any of these meetings to explain what a neighborhood wants. And when a neighborhood gets into a big problem, such as the Foxhall area, even that, they, they, they didn't bring 50% of everybody who lives here, but they'll come when their specific interests are being endangered otherwise, I don't think it's related to COVID. I just don't think they're going to, they're just going to come at all. Uh, improve workshop qualities and inspirational graphics. Uh, that's nice and slick, but I don't think it gets you anything. I mean, it's nice and visual and it feels good and we think we have a lot of money, but the, and then we go to the Parks Commission asking for $55,000. Well, we're going to have to fund that too. So we're up to $101,000. As to the, leverage, uh, the loss of opportunity to leverage the donated time. 
I don't believe the way you describe these people who were on the committee who were in Castle Hills, I can't, I can't imagine that they would say, sorry, we're leaving. Our work is not valued. I think they've done, they've done a, they obviously are doing an exceptionally good job. And I see no reason why that, the leverage of their work couldn't continue in-house considering that a lot of this work that is supposed to be done is going to be done in-house as, as it was demonstrated here. So we're basically doing most of the work and basically paying for exhibits of the same quality that could, that can only be done using planning professionals. Um, the, the, the key thing to all this is this. I think your group is doing a great job. I think you have all the intellectual firepower in that group to bring forth to the, to the council piecemeal projects as can be digested by the annual budget in light of the fact that we're trying to raise enough money without borrowing more money every year to fix already badly needed internal improvements in drainage and streets. I, I really appreciate you coming forth at this time. I would like it more if we, if we would consider this after the budget has been looked at and approved by the council so we can see if there is a, a slot that you perhaps can get some money I'm not really wild about giving any, but uh, I think it has to, we have to go through the budget process first to find out exactly where we stand. I noticed one thing as you read the suggestions from L and B, they've got a whole laundry list of some old ideas and some new ones, but absolutely no cost of. They're talking about a feasibility study of the existing city hall. And what's that going to cost? We have no idea. And then, but more, more importantly, what's it going to cost to implement the study? You know, the plan done by Dr. Colley and other people in the late 90s was an extraordinarily good plan. Uh, the mayor at the time, he was very proud of it and it was immediately put on the shelf. I resurrected it when I came on the council and I, we started culling good ideas from it at that time. And uh, I believe one of the ideas came from Mayor Smiley when he wanted to improve the updating to the code that we had here in the city. And we paid for it, I think it was $10,000 for an outside agency to update the code. It just seems to me this is an enormous fish to swallow. At one time, we're just about to go into the budget and we have no idea where we're going to be. And we already have an injunction by past council to say any surplus monies go to infrastructure and fixing the infrastructure. Uh, I would like to, after further discussion, perhaps move a motion that we table this item until after the budget has been worked on and approved. And perhaps in September, we revisit this to see if there is any room for these suggestions. But we are looking at over $100,000, just not 30. Thank you. Mayor, was anybody signed up to speak to this item? <clears throat> uh, yes, sir, there were. Um, if we can hear from them real quick and then we'll have you all back up, would y'all mind? Sure. Uh, first up, we have uh, Stacia's Prison. Mayor Trevino, City Council Member Stacia Spridgen, 304 Lock Haven Lane. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak about the comprehensive plan. Ms. Ms. Bridgen, yeah. just a little bit over. Perfect, thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak about the comprehensive plan advisory committee known as the CPAC. I agree with and think this effort is important for the future of Castle Hills. You may recall several years and in my experience, the last strategic plan committee was in 2014. The city invested in another resident driven initiative to develop a strategic plan for the city. Many residents worked diligently on this initiative, which culminated in a report to the city, the city leadership. I was on the council at that time. 
but it was not used and it was not considered. And I say that because I think with Castle Hills now becoming the it place to live, to work and to play, the CPAC efforts will afford us a great opportunity that should not be squandered to define and develop a plan for the city's future. Our city demographics are evolving and with that Castle Hills must evolve to ensure we remain a vibrant, viable and chosen city. I ask that council consider and approve the 70,000, the $101,000, whatever it's gonna take to hire the experienced professionals to do the heavy lift to draw the base drawings, assistance with citizen workshop exhibits and the CPAC documents. And all of that product can be used to bring people to the city for economic development, businesses, new families. Unfortunately, as Councilman Gregory mentioned, you know, he didn't think anybody was just gonna throw their hands up on the nine member committee and leave. Well, that's a lot of effort and work that they spend and that's not their full-time job. And they also have families. And unfortunately, my husband and I are leaving Castle Hills. We're moving in July because I have a new position that's gonna take me out of state. And I have to say, I love this city, love it dearly. We've been here for 12 years. We've vested, we've put in our time and our effort to volunteer, to be a part of the council, to be a part of the Castle Hills community organization. And if this short-sightedness at this point, and this keeps coming back, and if we don't do anything, then Castle Hills could be just absorbed into San Antonio and nobody would know the difference or care. So I think that council needs to take this seriously and seriously consider about approval of this money for the future. And that's what we're doing is investing in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Bruce Miley Califf. Uh, we have two more. Would you, you want to go last? Okay, perfect. Uh, Dr. Stephen Ackley. Thank you for listening to me. Um, it was a marvelous presentation and very professionally done. Obviously represents tremendous amount of work hours by multiple people, I can't imagine. But in considering this, um, I guess I just don't understand. I am well aware of the 1997 comprehensive plan. That was the one that said the lots west of West Avenue should be an acre. That was a plan that sat on the shelf. We have a copy at our home, but it was never enacted into ordinances. There was never a requirement by council or mayor that any new zoning plan, replatting, business granting, anything that we really do in this city had to reflect what the comprehensive plan of 1997 led us to believe our vision of the city would be. And I'm sure this new plan would be more up to date and it would be beautifully written and whether it's homegrown or with outside help, be a lovely document. But forgive me, I wanna know what is the big so what? There is no big so what unless a comprehensive plan is codified into ordinance. And that's not anything I'm hearing about this plan. It's not anything I saw in the 1997 plan. In 1997, I was 47 years old and my daughters were just finishing college and getting married. I now have a grandson in college. I'm 71 years old. I just don't see any traction, any forward movement on any of these comprehensive plans. I will be certainly pushing up daisies before anything happens from one of these, unless we know that if a product is produced by in-house or fancy consultants, that it's got to be codified into ordinance or we've got to devote ourselves to reflecting on every action. Does this reflect the comprehensive plan or does it not? Otherwise, there is no, excuse me, big so what? It's just a fancy polished document on the shelf. 
I've got to understand how that linkage occurs between the comprehensive plan and doing anything. And I don't see that and I don't understand that now. And I have seen no real link from the previous comprehensive plan. Please explain it to me. Otherwise, it's a huge effort with no result. And to put money behind that does seem not appropriate. I would vote for the solar panels. But thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Ms. Ackley. I uh, believe we also have Mr. McCormick. Mr. McCormick, are you still on the line with us? Yes, I'm still here. And uh, I think there's some misunderstanding about uh, the whole comprehensive plan idea. Um, and, and there's uh, some misunderstanding about where we spend our money. I think that somebody has decided that we don't need to plan anything. We just need to pick out a place where we, where we need to spend the money and throw all the money at that and not have to think about which we do first or which really is important to do or anything like that. The fact is that state law gives us the right to have a comprehensive plan in chapter 213 of the local government code, which says we may have an, a comprehensive plan for long range development of the municipality. And it may define the content and the design of a comprehensive plan. And it may include, but is not limited to, provisions on land use, transportation, and public facilities. Now that makes it sound like it's pretty much a, a, an optional sort of thing. But when you look over at chapter 211 on zoning, it, it's pretty clear in, in 211.004 that zoning regulations must be adopted in accordance with the comprehensive plan and must be designed to, and then it gives you a list of things, seven or eight items, uh, facilitate adequate provision of transportation, water, sewer, schools, parks, and other public requirements, lessen congestion in the streets, secure safety, and so forth. All of those, those sorts of things which you would expect from a plan. And the fact is that we have had a plan since 97, which I don't believe has been well used, but it's been there for a while. I don't think we really have used it as we probably should have uh, in preparing our regulations the last time they were reviewed. And I don't think we refer to it as we probably should in considering some of the things that come before the Zoning Commission. The importance of this plan is not that we just have a plan that we can stick up on the wall and throw darts at. It ha it's a plan for action, action with regard to land use, transportation, public safety, and so forth. And it results in a uh, capital improvement plan. And that's one of the things that you need to have to decide where to start with your infrastructure program and your drainage program. And Mr. Rampley, I think, has done an exemplary job of preparing a, a uh, capital improvements plan and making and implementing parts of it uh, that we haven't been able to do much for the past 10 years or so. And so I think we're, we're making steps in those directions. I agree with Mr. Mr. Uh, Gregory's uh, assessment that we may not need to spend the hundred thousand dollars on this plan. Uh, and I'm a little I'm a little put off by the idea that that our our offer of the, the estimate that we received had a significant increase between January and, and May. And I, I'm not sure that I see that as altogether justified, but nevertheless, I think that's where the expense, the, the, the expense may need to be spent. I, I think that some of that money uh, does need to be put towards putting together some, some decent exhibits. I'm not so sure that we need to have uh, pie in the sky exhibits of having a big uh, green strip down through the center of Castle Hills and, and walking paths all over the place and so forth. I think that, that we have to decide where those are gonna go. And that's one of the things that this committee is working on is to get citizen input to see what, what the city really needs to do to make the citizens happy with the future of our city and to make ourselves comfortable with the environment that we we propose to live out the rest of our lives in here in Castle Hills. I think that, they, that a, a plan of this sort is a useful and necessary 
I don't think it needs to include uh, a whole bunch of extraneous stuff. I don't think we need a lot of fluff about the demographics or our proposed growth where we have no opportunity for growth uh, by expanding the, the footprint of the city just because we're uh, landlocked. We don't have any place to grow. So we can't really take new land and, uh, and bring it in and hope to develop it, holding off on, with, on, paying, on, on charging taxes against it until sometime when the property has begun to pay back the builders or developers of the property because we don't have new land to bring in. We have, uh, there is no outside land. We have no extraterritorial jurisdiction to annex downstream. Nevertheless, we have a whole bunch of projects that we know need to be done. And Mr. Rapley has done a, a great job of putting those together in the, in the uh, capital improvements plan and the drainage plans that he's developed with the engineers over the past couple of years. <laughs> So I think this is a place where we put together what we want for land use, like the residential rural uh, residential uh, district and that sort of thing. And business development to the extent that we can develop business. And that would go into my version of, of the plan. Uh, I think there are a whole bunch of things we need to do. This is one of them. I think you don't throw money at infrastructure necessarily without some idea of where to start and what your end is, what your goal is. So throwing money at the infrastructure by itself is not a useful uh, concept in my point of view. I think we need to have a plan how that money needs to be spent. This is a plan that leads in that direction. I don't think we, uh, I don't think we can put off doing it again for another 23 years uh, and hope that we, we survive all right. The state law requires our zoning regulations to, com to comport with a, a comprehensive plan. And if we don't have a comprehensive plan, that makes that real awkward, it seems to me. I think there's some good to be had from it. Uh, question is, for the council to decide, how do we best make use of this effort by the committee? Uh, you've, you've identified these, these folks on the committee as, as having among them a lot, of, a lot of talent, people that can do some stuff. Maybe we can make use of that, uh, uh, spending less than what we've asked for, but I think there is some real benefit to putting some cash towards it. Uh, and the fact is that most of the cities I've looked at, and I've looked at a couple of dozen small towns in Texas, it's hard to find one our size, but the, the towns that I've looked at have all put significant expenditures of their funds towards the development of these kinds of plans question is how much of it can we afford to, to put up uh, and what are we willing to do uh, to, pr to preserve the future of Castle Hills in the direction that we want it to go. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. This is from uh, Mr. Paul Gonzalez, uh, 107 Wick, Wickford Way. Good evening, Mayor Trevino, Council Members, and Mr. Rapley. I write to address item 6.10 on the City Council agenda for May 18th, 2021. Since I am unable to make these comments in person or online due to conflicting end of year school activities. Item 6.10 is the discussion update of the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee on progress to regarding development of a comprehensive plan and the possible engagement of professional assistance. In order to avoid potential TOMA, Texas Open Meetings Act, pitfalls of sending the entire council an email, other members of the city council are addressed as a BCC. My family, are still, my family and I are still relative newcomers to Castle Hills since we've only been here only six and a half years. We enjoy living in the estates neighborhoods within the area loops, in the area south of Loop 410, Zone 4, of the city according to the June 1997 city comprehensive plan. The resident and business survey promulgated by the comprehensive plan advisory committee earlier this year was a necessary step to update, to update the 1997 plan, but it clearly represents only a preliminary step to updating or replacing the existing plan. The area has changed dramatically over the past 25 years and Castle Hills would benefit from acquisition of even more information with professional assistance as how to best to assess and balance local priorities, 
that can be used to guide the city for at least the next decade. For this reason, I encourage continuation of efforts led by, by the Comprehensive Plan Advisory Committee, including financial support of the council. Our, ha our family is happy to be part of Castle Hills and we look forward to participating in this far-sighted and much needed process. Should you have any questions, please do not hes hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much. Paul Gonzalez. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Caleb or Mr. Smiley Caleb and then uh, Ms. Hopke. <laughs> Bonnie Hopke, 111 Amerson. I am the uh, chairwoman of the Parks and Special Projects Commission, which uh, part of what this effort came out of was Jack plus the commission working together to, and we've heard the same presentation one of the things that I do want to address is I, th I am for the comprehensive plan for a number of reasons. One is that at the end of the day, that we all hope that we don't spend any time. I mean, through the years, there has been a lot of time spent on plans that sat on the shelf. Even with the commission, we have the Texas A&M plan that sat on the shelf for years and years and years. And it's time that the city grew up and realized that planning is important. It's important we let the infrastructure sit to the point where every dollar has to go to infrastructure which is very short-sighted because what we're doing is looking backwards to fix problems instead of looking forwards to where we wanna be in the future. So to continue to put every dollar that we have to, to fix problems just says we're never gonna get beyond where we are today. We can't just keep throwing money when a problem comes up and says, I have this money, let's put it there. We need the long plan of how we wanna spend our money. The city's money, the taxpayer's money, and th that the taxpayers have a say in how that money gets spent and how that comprehensive plan is put together. For some of you that have been involved with the Parks and Projects Commission, we have a vision for what we would like to see in the commons. And, you know, but that vision also takes money and it also feeds into the comprehensive plan. It feeds into a plan for what we do with this building and just saying now, well, let's put solar panels up doesn't is, is also very short-sighted in that that's today's problem. This building has a bigger problem than needing solar panels. We need more space. We need a more energy efficient building that maybe we put solar panels on. And this plan, this comprehensive plan that's being put together now with a lot of effort from a lot of people is the first step in moving forward for this city and not continuing to look back and try to change history. You can't change history. We are where we are today, but let's change our future going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoppe. Uh, Mr. Smiley Caleb. I'm Bruce Smiley Caleb. I live at 247 Fox Hall Lane. And I'm a member of this subcommittee. Um, plus, it's an hour and a half past my bedtime, so this is a stretch for me. I'll try to keep it coherent. Um, I want to bring a little perspective to this whole situation. Tonight, I have had a myriad of emotions watching the entire meeting, um, the rural residential thing and the discussion, what it was brought to the table, the thoughtfulness of this council working together. Um, but I want to give a little historic look back on this comprehensive plan issue. 
And Douglas, I agree with you. You and I are probably the oldest ones in here. I'm much older than you are. But you remember the manpower and, and the efforts that went into all the previous plans. Very well-meaning citizens worked on this many times. The last significant one was when I was mayor, we put together the strategic planning committee and we met diligently. We weren't as organized technically as this committee is. We could never have put together a, a presentation like this. this. This is some of the committee members bringing their individual talent to the table. But I was, and I'll name names. I'm not above naming names. Barry Middleman sat with me and Guy Lassanini one day, two extremely phenomenally talented people, and said, Bruce, we're professionals. We work every single day very hard. The city of Castle Hills can't expect us to do the work of a professional company that can accurately put this together in a plan that they've done for other people. Um, this committee, as it stands right, and by the way, we had about $45,000 worth of time in at that time, and the professional company we were talking to at that time was going to charge $40,000 to take our work, massage it, and it was nowhere near the comprehensive nature that this plan is looking at and the process is looking at. I agree with that, with what he said then, and I agree with it now. Um, we have put a couple of hundred thousand dollars in this pot, and that's being very conservative. We've worked very hard at putting that presentation together and what it shows. But gentlemen, this is a look forward. This is a process. And one of the things, and I say this with many 30 years of experience as a resident and about 12 years as a politician, we've got to plan. We've got to plan. It's so hard, and I know it's hard to say, let's spend $55,000 tonight. But that's the ask, gentlemen, $55,000, because that's what it's going to take to take it to the next step and do it right. Don't talk to me as a citizen about infrastructure when you don't know where it's supposed to go. Don't talk to me in a political nature, which I'm one of the best at, of saying the people want this. Gentlemen, we don't know. We may know what the 25 people that call us say. We may know what the two people that catch us in the grocery store say. But we do not have the ability the talent or the time to sit down and put together a brilliant, well thought through plan that addresses analytically, granularly, the needs and the wants of our citizens. Now, will everyone show up? No, they aren't going to show up. You're absolutely correct. They're gonna show up in this building if something's hitting the fan and it's going to affect them. But guess what? This plan is going to affect everyone. When I saw the picture and personally, when I saw the picture of the drawing of City Hall, I'm oh God, here we go again with City Hall. We're gonna get sidetracked on rebuilding City Hall. Guess what? When it's time to rebuild City Hall, we will have something in front of us this shows us what it can be, what we as the political forces in this city go out and talk to the people about the, what we want to do. Y'all borrowed money this year for the first time in a long time. I salute you for that. We needed to do that. We looked at bond issues. They didn't work for us. They didn't work for me, right or wrong. We've looked at different borrowing techniques, didn't work. We do right now have the funds to fund this. This is exactly, and by the way, I was there too. I was there in the beginning as a councilman.